Number one, gather up all of your cash, stuff it into empty milk cartons, and then go hide it in your attic. I'm totally kidding. A lot of the strategies that our grandparents and previous generations, a lot of the strategies that they used for acquiring wealth, saving money, taking care of themselves, having some security financially, a lot of those strategies are a little outdated. They're not gonna work today, okay? But lots of them still do work and still will work. And those are the ones that we're gonna talk about today, the ones that you can actually do. You're welcome to do the milk carton thing, but I would urge you to ask Mike Cross how that went for his grandmother, okay? Number one, don't go to college. I know, calm down, please. Don't throw tomatoes just yet, okay? Hear me out. While college was a newfangled thing in some of our grandparents and their parents' generation, and for a lot of people, it made a lot of sense, and as the years went on, it became more and more the norm for people to go to college, and quite frankly, it became necessary in order for you to get a decent paying job. However, that day has passed. Am I saying that no one should ever go to college? Absolutely not. However, going to college with a very specific career tract in mind, something that, say, requires a college degree, a further education like being a lawyer or a doctor or something that requires you to get a degree and certification in order to practice in that field, those are necessary things for college or university. However, just going for four years and getting a general business degree not only does not guarantee you employment after college, does guarantee you, however, a whole lot of debt. Perhaps your family is wealthy. Why are you watching this video? You don't need old fashioned tips. But for most people, college is going to become a tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt for them to be strapped onto their back at the ripe old age of 22. It's not good. We're causing controversy from the jump. Now, does that mean that like, what, what am I supposed to do? You don't have to work? Of course not. Our grandparents' generation and other previous generations were very like strong with the entrepreneurial spirit, okay? They like to start businesses. That's how we ended up with so many mom and pop shops, little restaurants, small businesses. These were started by people, individuals, families, etc. Of course, I'm not saying that everyone has to go out and start a business, but it's not a bad idea. And quite frankly, the barrier to entry is lower than ever because there's so many businesses that you can run online, so many things that you can do online that don't require a huge amount of money as an upfront cost to start it. So working for yourself, becoming your own boss is a path to wealth. And by the way, in case I haven't defined my terms here, I just want you to be very clear that I'm not actually trying to tell you how to get rich. We're just talking about strategies to be a better steward of your money, to give yourself some financial security. It's not about becoming rich and buying a yacht and sailing around the world with your pet zebra and your, I don't know, $10 million diamond necklace. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about paths to financial security, good stewardship of your money, being able to take care of yourself and your family and invest in the things that matter to you and that are important to you. I'm not here to tell you what to do with your money. I'm only here to discuss ways in which you might save some of it, make more of it. Which of course brings us to number three, which is to take calculated risks. We kind of live in a very risk adverse world. We want guarantees of safety. We want guarantees that nothing bad is gonna happen to us anywhere we go. And we kind of expect other people to provide that for us. And in reality, that's really not possible. So taking ownership of our lives and being willing to take some calculated risks in life is what is going to produce good outcomes for us. It's hard to really do anything beyond the status quo if you're never willing to take a risk. I'm not talking about sending a Nigerian prince money because he tells you that he's going to swoop you away and take you off I don't know, on his yacht. I am talking about wise business decisions, investing in things that you see potential in, and just being willing to take some financial risks where it makes sense for you and your family and your lifestyle. Number four is a little bit of stick to okay? A willingness to follow through, to stick to a plan, to make a plan and to stick to it. Not to bail on the plan at the first sign that something's going wrong. Just because you see a little water on the boat doesn't mean we have to jump ship, it's sinking, right? Our grandparents knew that sometimes you're gonna have to weather the storm with something. If you really believe in it, if you make a plan, if you can stick to it, that is where the fruit, the good stuff comes from. And and what better way to stick to a plan than to have a helpful resource to help you do that? That's where today's video sponsor, Rocket Money, comes in. I genuinely, hear me say this, genuinely love and use Rocket Money and have for multiple years now. It's simply an app 
that is going to help you save money and manage your money better. They help you with a lot in the area of personal finance. They're going to help you lower your bills, cancel unwanted subscriptions, keep an eye on your credit score, set budgets that you can stick to and manage your money just better in general. Two of my favorite features that I have used is the cancel unwanted subscriptions. They're gonna help you cancel those because they're gonna identify them for you and say, hey, by the way, psst, you're paying for this thing every month. Do you wanna be? And you can say, no, I don't. And they will help you cancel that unwanted subscription. They help their customers save an average of like $720 a year by canceling unwanted subscriptions. And of course, my other favorite is the ability to totally customize and make bespoke budgets within your app. We have like farm spending. What are we spending on the horses? What are we spending um, on our house renovation stuff? You can set your budgets and categorize expenses. It's amazing. You get the graphics, the pie charts, all the things that make my little visual information loving heart very happy because I can see it. It's not just numbers, which my brain is like gobbledygook, but it's a pretty colorful chart, which makes a lot more sense to my brain. I would highly encourage you to check out Rocket Money. It can really help you achieve your financial financial goals, financial freedom, just visit rocketmoney.com slash Angela and you can try it out for free. I also have a link down below in the description box. Of course, if we're budgeting, we also need to be cutting spending. Our grandparents were very good at cutting costs when they needed to, at being very, um, cutthroat sounds a little harsh, but being very discerning about where to spend money, where not to, what made sense to spend money on, and quality. You know, they didn't own nearly as many clothes as we own today on average. However, they also didn't buy cheap clothes like we buy today. Um, they invested in quality pieces. And I was even reading an article from like back in the 30s and 40s about the cost of even for a, you know, quote unquote, poor person, the cost of a dress compared to their income was pretty high. It was kind of very surprising to me because a lot of us are used to like grabbing something for 20 or 30 bucks. And it was not uncommon for them to spend a much higher portion of their income on pieces. Now, of course, they would wear those pieces over and over again and get the absolute most out of them, which brings me to my next point, which is to mend things that are broken. Our grandparents' generation knew a thing or two about being handy, being able to do things themselves, being able to fix things, mend things, repair things. I don't think you could find probably a, a woman in you know grandparents and beyond generation who didn't at least have basic sewing skills. Today, I would argue most women have zero basic sewing skills. Conversely, okay, I'm not picking on women here, I am one, but men, for example, they would at least have the basic understanding of how to repair home appliances, how to change the oil in their car, how to change a tire. Of course, caveat here that a lot of cars, these newfangled cars with all the fancy buttons and the flying spaceships, it's not so easy. You can't just change your oil yourself. That's part of how they get you. Being able to be more self-sufficient, it's not about living out on some piece of property in the middle of nowhere, you know, slaughtering your own cows and chickens and got their milk in every day. While many people do quite enjoy going back to those simple basic ways of living, we're talking about acquiring some very basic skills in order to improve your self-sufficiency score. Who's scoring it? I don't know. It ain't me. But there's a lot of ways that our budgets really get busted and we kind of bleed money by not being able to repair things ourselves and we just have to replace it. So just keeping that in mind, again, this video is meant to be encouraging. I'm not scolding. There's a lot of stuff I don't know how to do. I've totally lost track of the numbers. I don't know what number we're on. So I'll just pop it up here on screen. Next is to pay cash as much as you can. There's so many reasons why this is a good idea for as long as we're able to. At some point, I have a feeling we're gonna lose our ability to use cash. So for now, use cash, keep cash. And when I say pay cash, that also includes not going into debt where you could help it. By cash, I mean monies that you have available to you that you can get into a liquid form so you can pour it. You know what I'm saying? Money that you don't have to go into debt to use. Previous generations didn't finance cars as often. Now, again, I completely understand that like the income to expense ratio was very different then. However, there are still ways to operate within this mindset. These are strategies, so if it's a strategy you can use, use it. And that's to pay cash where you can, stay out of debt as much as you can. I feel like that's a no-brainer. Next is to buy things used. Now, I feel like 
as somebody who loves to talk about some like vintage old fashioned things, this is coming a little bit back in to fashion. Okay. People like finding hidden gems uh, on Facebook marketplace or at the thrift store or whatever, but there are lots of things beyond just tchotchkes and trinkets that we can find used and purchase used. One of the biggest like epiphanies, which shouldn't be an epiphany, but it is that I've had is that holy cow are my children. I have eight of them, by the way, in case you're new here. I have eight of them. They're very hard on furniture, okay? I don't know, you know that saying, like you weren't raised in a barn. Maybe they were, I'm not sure. They're swinging from the rafters like monkeys, not really. But they do tear up an Ikea dresser with an uncanny speed. I have gotten sick of having to replace pieces of furniture. And one of the things that I noticed was that my old furniture bedroom set that came from my great grandmother, the thing is like 80 years old, it's just old solid granny in the corner over there, like open my drawers 50 times a day. I don't care. I mean, she is just going strong. I really find that finding good quality pieces of furniture, of course there's good quality new furniture, but that is very, very, very expensive. Whereas you can spend about the same as you would spend at Ikea and get a piece of furniture from an antique store that you can of course refinish, redo, fun project, teaching you skills. It will last a heck of a lot longer. And it's not just furniture either, right? Of course you think about buying a used car, all of that, but used clothing is a great way to invest in those really quality pieces that we talked about earlier that are going to last you for a really long time, but you're going to be able to get them at a fraction of the price because you bought them used. I will give this example because I think it's a good one. Designer handbags, for example. And of course, there's a lot of excess, a whole lot of excess there. However, I purchased a used Louis Vuitton bucket bag that was from the year I was born. Okay. So it's almost 40 years old. And that handbag is still kicking strong and good. It does look used. I'm not saying that it looks new, but there's absolutely no rips in the seams, nothing. It was designed as like a champagne bag. So it was meant to carry like five or six champagne bottles. It's durable. Okay. It is durable as heck. It's more expensive than what I would pay for a purse at Walmart or Target or something like that. But I don't think you're going to find any of those still kicking around in 40 years. Those are all going to be in the landfill. So there's some areas that I think it can make sense if there's something that you really like to invest in a used one. I'm just going to give you full transparency. That purse costs about $400 and I would be willing to bet in the lifetime of most women, they spend far more than that on cheap handbags from Target and Walmart, etc., that just are not going to last, not going to stand the test of time. So this is in no means an indictment on your decision to or to not purchase a designer or expensive or whatever kind of things. I'm just sharing a little anecdote, a little story to say, sometimes paying a little more is going to get you a product that's going to last a really, really, really long time. What better point to get to than this one after just discussing designer bags, and that is to avoid lifestyle creep. One of the things when we look at like old money, there's all these terms that are very, you know, in the zeitgeist right now and people love to use. And then when people see them, they're like, Rare, they automatically get like mad about it and stuff. Here's the thing, okay? When we're talking about like old money, there's extremes in every area. I'm talking about the people who quite frankly are some of the most wealthy that you wouldn't really even know that. Most of the time, the way that they live their lives it's not apparent that they have as much money as they do. And I think that a lot of that is because they have avoided lifestyle creep. As they made more money, they didn't choose to spend more money. That's something that is very personal and can be very difficult, especially if you've really gone without. Sometimes you try to swing the pendulum the other way. No judgment here. I'm just saying that one of the things to consider is as I'm getting further in my life and more financially sound, am I allowing that to then lead me to lifestyle creep to start asking, can I afford that? Wow, I can afford that. Instead of like, can I live without that? I don't need that. It's just a way that we think about things and I'm not perfect. So again, no judgment for me, just something to chew on. Next is finding free forms of entertainment. Previous generations worked hard, but they played hard too. Now, again, a lot of people didn't have money to like, I, like I said, like go boating. And I don't know, why can't I think of any other rich person hobby other than yachting? T tennis? I don't, golf? 
but I mean, lots of people play tennis and golf who aren't rich, so I don't know. I'm not talking about those kinds of hobbies. I'm talking about like the regular folk, us plebes of the world. They would get off work and people would find free ways to entertain themselves, games to play, communities to be a part of. And of course, you can find a lot of free entertainment that involves just vegging out on the sofa, essentially, but you can also find a lot of free entertainment that will allow you to get out of the house and explore the world and be around other human beings, which some days sounds like the worst thing ever. But it's good for you. If you're a hermit like I am and you just wanna stay in your house and your little cave, I encourage you to get out of your cave. You'll have fun once you're out. You know, it's like working out. No one ever really wants to work out, but when you're doing it, you're glad. And when you're done, you feel good about it. Same thing. When you go out to the people places, it's like, ugh. But then you're like, okay, this wasn't so bad, you know? It's not so bad, I promise. Just come out of the cave. I will actually link you down below in the description box to a number of free entertainment resources for you if you are looking to have a little fun but not spend so much money. Now, of course, let's like talk a little bit about money specifics. Investing. Now, investing can be very scary. I will definitely admit that if you don't have like financial prowess or someone in your family who knows about it that has like imparted that wisdom onto you, it can be like, I, 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 I don't know, okay? One of the things that I found a few years ago was an app called Acorn or Acorns. I don't remember exactly. I'll link them down below. It's kind of cool because you can take a set amount. Let's say you've got $500 and that's where you want to start your investments. You can tell them like, I want an aggressive, a moderately aggressive, a conservative investment portfolio. Um, and then you choose, like you put your initial money in, then you can have like $5 a week added to that and it just kind of runs in the background it's just kind of forget about it honestly and then one day you open up the app and you're like well hot dog look at that my money grew and it's kind of cool i really like it because it takes some of the stress and pressure off of like choosing investments uh, now if you've got a lot more money like you need to go find an investment broker this video ain't for you but for most people, we want an easy way to step into investments without being overwhelmed. And for me, this has been a really great one, a very easy one. Um, and it's just been fun to watch the money just sit there and grow, doing the work for me. You know, I always appreciate that. And that brings me to at least having a cursory understanding of compound interest. Again, I think previous generations did have a better handle on money and had a better handle on uh, investing and where to spend money, what kind of accounts. I think a lot of us today just know very little because we're like, you got a checking account, you got a savings account, maybe you got a credit card, right? And that brings me to understanding the basics of like compounding interest because it's very, very powerful. And when you actually do the math and look at it, you spring chickens who are significantly younger than I am, you will be shocked to see how your money will grow with compounding interest over the years if you start investing younger. I wish, I wish, wish, wish that I would have paid more attention to that and understood that younger because even when we didn't have much, I could have clawed away $5 here and there, which means a lot more over time than trying to make up for that in your 30s and 40s by throwing more money you don't have the time anymore. So it's very interesting. Again, I will link you to a couple of articles down below that will help you understand compounding interest and why it's so important when you're trying to save money and build yourself a little, uh, whether it's like a safety net, a nest egg, an emergency fund, whatever, interest is powerful. And lastly, we come to taxes. Taxing yourself, okay? That's really what taking money out before you spend it, before you touch it, and moving it to savings. That's every time you get paid, putting money aside into savings, doing it before you've had a chance to touch it. That's why sometimes those programs where, you know, your employer will automatically move money to savings or a 401k, or you can do that with your bank every time, you get your paycheck deposited, they'll automatically take a percentage or a set amount and move that to your savings. Um, I also really love those savings accounts where they roll over the change from every dollar that you spend gets rolled over and put into savings. Just things that are happening without you thinking about it and without you having to make the decision because especially when you're feeling like, oh, I don't have any money, I'm broke, I'm broke. You are, even if you're actually not and you could afford to make that deposit into your savings, many people won't because we get a little frantic and panicky. And so it really is like a gift to yourself. And this is something that I do think that 
previous generations, our grandparents were much better at looking at the long term at understanding the long arc of their lives, of their marriages, of their jobs, careers, and taking that into account when making decisions that were like, I'm going to plant these little seeds today that don't feel like much, but in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, they're going to pay dividends. They're going to be these huge, big, beautiful flowers that I get to harvest. These are just some of the strategies, the ways of living, the sort of like frugal living habits and tips that they used in their lives every day to help them save money, get rich, build wealth. And we can absolutely, at the very least, pay attention to some of these things and be able to apply them in our own lives when and where we can.